Well, let me start this lecture, which I'm very pleased to be invited to give, on the debt of life by giving you a little bit of advice if you are ever called upon to give a public lecture. Be careful about picking up new books three days before you're due to give the lecture. I say this because up till then, I thought I had a perfectly adequate lecture to give to you in this series. I've been working for some time on what the Hebrew Bible, or Old Testament, has to say about the lives of elderly people and what responsibilities their families and the rest of the society have to the elderly. And it's undeniable that that's a question of great contemporary relevance. The so-called crisis of care in this country and in many parts of the world where the number of elderly people is increasing, while the number of people in work remains relatively static, is very real. And it probably impinges on many, if not all of us, in this room. I just wanted to show you a little graphic. I don't know if you can see that from the back. I think it applies to the States, the United States, but the same is is true in this country. You see, in 1970, for every person over 65 years old, there were 13.5 people in work who could work and supply the pensions of the people over 65. 2015, and we're past that now, It's 4.9 per person over 65. That's a bit of a difference. Project that forward, of course you have to make a lot of assumptions, to 2030, 2.1. So every working person has to support at least half uh, the cost of someone over 65. You can see why governments and other people get in a bit of a panic about this. And it seems to me quite interesting, as someone who studies biblical studies, to think what is the kind of message that looking at the Hebrew Bible would give us about what you do in such a situation. Or at least it's the kind of thing that many people do. You may know this gentleman... David Mowat, the Under Secretary of State for Community Health and Care. Now, he just last week, and this turned out to be quite fortuitous for me, ventured an opinion on this very subject. He, of course, has care of this area under the government. And speaking to the local government select committee, this is what he's reported to have said. I've written it up there, it's a bit small. One of the things that has struck me as I've been doing this role is that nobody ever questions the fact that we look after our children. That's just obvious. Now, anybody who has ever been in any of my lectures will know the first thing I say to my students is, one word is forbidden in my lectures, and only one, and that is the word obvious. The whole business of a university is to explore what people tell you is obvious. Nobody ever says it is a caring responsibility, it's just what you do. I think some of that logic and some of the way we think about that in terms of the sort of volume of numbers that we are seeing coming down the track will have to impinge on the way we start thinking about how we look after our parents. In a way, it's a responsibility in terms of our life cycle that is similar. So here is the Minister for Care saying there's an obvious, an obvious duty of care to our children. We should have exactly the same duty of care, or at least think about it in the same way, in relation to our parents. Now, you could question that on a number of points. Well, first of all, this obvious thing, well, there seem to be quite a lot of parents and a lot of children around the world and in our country where this isn't quite working as obviously as all that. Why do we have a care system for children if it's 
if this is just all so obvious. Not for everyone. Secondly, we choose, or at least within some limits on that word, we choose to have children. You can opt to have more or not so many. We do not choose to have parents. We arrive with them already in tow, so to speak. But equally, on the other side, there is a slight implication from Mr. Mowat that, there are, that it, this has not occurred to people, that uh, somehow people are going to have to be told to care for their parents. Well, there's a good deal of caring going on at the moment. Many people who are caught in the sometimes very strenuous business of nurturing the coming generation as well as looking after their own parents. Many people are already in that situation. So um, I think it would be unfair to over-subject David Mowat's statement to analysis. Um, it was a remark made in the course of a briefing. But it seemed to me a bit of a godsend for the kind of uh, issue I wanted to look at. The care of parents and care of children, he seems to be saying, are both responsibilities that are unquestionable. They're of a kind of class of actions where no one is really questioning whether it's good or not to do this. They are, or they should be, in his words, just what you do. It's not a matter of saying, is it right or wrong? It's just what you do. It's strange, then, that people clearly don't always do them, at least in the case of their parents. And that opens up space for wondering if we can't give a better basis for these actions than simply saying to people, that's just what people do, so you get on and do it. Now, I'm not really a philosopher. I'm not a sociologist. I study the interpretation of the Bible. For good or ill, one resource that people turn to in trying to give reasons for what people do is the Bible. For some, it's because they view the Bible as a, as a source of revealed truth and of revealed, divinely instituted moral guidance. That's fine. But what interests me is how much of what we view as socially right and what people do has a basis in the history of interpretation of the Bible, even when people have forgotten it or choose to ignore it. And I say advisedly the history of interpretation of the Bible because it's not so much the Bible that affects our culture, it's how people have understood the Bible. And there can be a bit of a difference between those. So maybe the most useful thing I can do as a biblical scholar is to point out what's said on the topic in the Bible, what comes from subsequent interpretations, and then invite people to consider whether they are happy to act on those conclusions. So the lecture I was proposing to give looks at the evidence, biblical and extra-biblical, of what the life of the elderly was actually like in ancient Israel. What can we ever know about that? And then what the biblical writers have to say about the duties and responsibilities that families and wider society have to the elderly. Then there's a th third question, how far were those ideals ever reflected in actual practice? And then to raise the crucial question, what relevance does any of that, what happened in an ancient society two and a half thousand years ago or so, have for those of us living in a post-industrial society where life expectancies and all the many conditions of social life are vastly different from those in any ancient society? That's the lecture I was going to give. This is the way it was going to start. In Antigone's, his magisterial overview of the impact of the myth of Antigone on Western cultures, 
George Steiner, the literary critic, points out that for the 18th and much of the 19th century, it was Sophocles' Antigone that was seen as the most sublime and perfect product of Greek civilization in its exploration of the conflict between the demands of society and the authenticity of the individual. The 20th century, by contrast, has, in the wake of Freud, exalted the claims of another of Sophocles' works, Oedipus the King, not least because of its importance for psychoanalysis. If the 19th century is the century of Antigone, the 20th of Oedipus, what about our 21st century? Well, it's a bit early to say but I'm going to put, stick my neck out and argue that this may be the century of Euripides and particularly of his play Alcestis. Prophetically, in 1999, before the century started, Ted Hughes published his version of the play and it's begun to appear ever more, re ever more regularly in a number of revivals and translations. It's a fascinating work, the plot of which turns on King Admetus, who's been told that he will die unless someone is prepared to die in his stead. Boiling it down very briefly. And that immediately raises the question for him and for the audience, who owes us a death? If you were told you were to die and then had to choose the person that you had to approach to say, well, actually, I'd rather live, but, you know, I've got the opportunity. If you'll die in my stead, what about it? Who would you go to? But even if somebody offered to lay down their life in these circumstances, would I be justified in accepting such a sacrifice? Well, it's, a, it's an ancient Greek play, and it's an extreme scenario, Nobody's likely to give us that offer, we hope. But in a world where manifestly lives are valued and some are valued more than others, these kind of questions do still resonate. We as members of the Western elite population, we live in circumstances where many in third world countries pay a price of much shortened lifespans um, so that our lifestyle can be maintained. Their, wives, their lives worth less than ours? How did this come about? In the play, the question is raised at the very beginning when the god Apollo encounters death on his way to claim Ad Admetus. So the king is, hasn't found anybody to volunteer. Death's on his way. Hercules meets him. Um, the god hints broadly it would be a better thing if death killed, quote, those who put off death too long. I.e., if death's going to kill anybody, he ought to kill the elderly. The old are of less value than the young in this circumstance. Indeed, desperately seeking a stand-in, Admetus first turns to his parents. After all, they're old. They've lived their lives. Their future years are going to be a story of decline and inevitable death. They gave him life and dedicated themselves to bringing up their beloved son, who is now at the peak of his potential as king. Surely, they're the ideal candidates for this bargain, exchanging their already spent lives to ensure the survival of their offspring, who has everything ahead of him. An elderly life is already spent. It's not going to be worth the same as a young person's life, surely. As the place uh, unfolds, Admetus' wife, Alcestis, after whom the play is named, who has said that she would be willing to do this, 
Should a man let his wife do that for him? She begins visibly to sicken, distressing Admetus and also the Greek chorus. Of course, there's a chorus in the play. And they all turn on the parents, accusing them of lacking the courage to rescue their own son. The issue is brought to a head in an an exchange between Admetus and his father, who arrives to console his son on the loss of his beloved wife. He praises the woman for saving not only Admetus' life, but his own as a father, because she's sparing him the grief of losing a son. Admetus turns on him. He states brutally to Phares, you are no father of mine. This is a man, the father figure, who's content to stand aside and let a foreign woman die for his son when he'd already lived a full and rewarding life and would have gained honor for his sacrifice. Now, the interesting thing is Fairy's retorts that he's done all that a father could or should do for Admetus. He rejects any implication that a father is obliged to die for his son. No such tradition exists in any of the Greek lands, he argues. He also rejects the idea that life loses its sweetness and value for the elderly. On the contrary, he says, the very fact that my days are limited adds to their sweetness. And when we think about it, compared to the eternity of death, every human life is short, only a matter of degree. It's Admetus who's the coward in consenting to let his wife die in his stead. He's the one who's seeking to live beyond the span that the gods have decreed. Don't come telling me I'm a coward. The quarrel heightens, but the basic points have been made. Admetus finishes his final speech where he disowns his own father, which is quite a thing in ancient Greek culture, with an observation that was already a commonplace, which Sophocles had used in his Arcisius. No one loves life as much as an aging man. So do the elderly owe the young a life? Or as Fieris argues, are the young always already in an infinite debt to those who gave them the gift of life in the first place? As Hughes, in his translation, puts it, the father says to the son, I gave you your opportunity, your life. Nothing obliges me to give you mine. I've already given you one life. Now, that's, I go back to the ancient Greeks rather the, than to the Hebrew tradition because there's nothing quite like that dramatic opposition. But I hope it shows that this issue is not a new one. Who owes who a life? Is there a debt owed? Is the son infinitely indebted to the parents just by the very fact of being? And that's a debt that can never be truly repaid. Or does the father owe the son the fullness of the life that he started? And his life, in some sense, has diminished in value because it's half spent. Now, that's the beginning of the lecture I was going to give. It does at least suggest some of the question of the duties of the young to the old in terms of debt and what people owe each other. It's quite explicit in Alcestis, that language of debt, and we can find it almost everywhere else we look in the ancient Near East. But that's where my problem occurred. That's where I made my mistake. I read another book. Never do that. 
The book in question has been a worldwide bestseller and has recently given rise to a series of programs on Radio 4. Looking around at this audience, some of you might have even heard it. It's David Graeber's book, Debt, The First 5,000 Years. I'll put that up there. There he is. And this book has been a worldwide bestseller in which he proposes the radical idea that the present economic woes of the world, you do realize we are in a certain economic pickle since 2008, can be traced back to one fundamentally flawed proposition. It says it's the big lie we've all been sold. The idea that debts should be paid says that's a lie and we've all been sold it and it's what's got us into the pickle we're in now he's particularly interested in the development potential collapse of advanced capitalism but his argument extends in this book to the whole of our social fabric now I can see even on some expressions here that's a slightly alarming proposal the idea that debts are to be paid is ingrained in us from a very early age. It is, to quote David Mart again, what people do. It's not a matter of arguing whether it's right or wrong to repay a debt. That's what you do. But that, of course, is what creditors will tell you. What about the debtors? We demand that others pay their debts to us but we're quite capable at the same time of resenting the demands of others that we pay them, especially if we feel we've been trapped or duped into a debt that we could not foresee. You suddenly discover that the the phone contract you thought had something in it has obliged you to pay a good deal more than you ever realized. Well, people should pay their debts. doesn't mean to say you have to like it. Well, all very well and good. Thank you, Mr. Graeber, for asking this question. But what's that got to do with the attitude to the aged in the Hebrew Bible and what we should be doing about the aged in our society? Well, Graeber provides the answer himself. After all, he entitled his book, Debt, The First 5,000 Years. This is not a new problem. To simplify a complex argument, he claims there's not a shred of evidence for the common myth in every economics textbook that sees the beginnings of economics and of the monetary system in barter and the growth of money and debt economies out of increasing sophistication of what began as an exchange between free and equal economic partners. There's a sort of myth that everybody lived on an island, some people had fish, some people had bananas, the people with the fish gave some of their fish to the banana, well, I'll not go on. But but then somebody decided, yeah, but I'm not really that keen on bananas, Um, I'd like to swap it for something else. The whole thing gets very complicated, and you event currency, and then we're into modern economics in, in new shape. Instead, he takes us back to ancient Mesopotamia and the origin of money, cash money, as a development not from trade at all, but from sacrifice. He offers a theory, uh, which others have offered, which he calls primordial debt. In essence, he argues that it was out of religious systems that the idea that life itself was a debt grew. The life that we owe so, that we owe our lives to somebody, not just money, but our lives. All that can repay the debt that we've already intrinsically recur- incurred by the very fact of being born would be our life. I mean, that's all you can really trade for it. But that kind of leads you nowhere. Instead, we offer the life of sacrificial animals. And if they're not available, we develop other tokens that can be seen to be of equivalent value. And from this, he argues, develops the idea 
that the life of a human being can be given some kind of cash value. That's slightly anachronistic, but that's the idea. Something that's seen in all ancient law codes, including biblical laws. You don't have to give life, or you don't have to cut off your arm. You pay money, or you give oxen, you give silver. So, Graeber's argument is that this metaphor of debt is shot through all our religious systems. There's a particular way in which it works in Christianity. And that this idea of a kind of existential obligation, just the kind of debt we don't like, you wake up and discover, hey, I never asked for this, but turns out I'm infinitely indebted to my forebears and to God, that doesn't lead to happy lives. It shapes our psychology and our society in far-reaching ways. Now, these ideas have been much discussed. I'm not necessarily going to say I agree with everything he said. My summary is only touching on parts of the argument. But the reason reading this book rather disrupted what I thought I was going to say about this is that it forced me to notice how often the metaphors of debt and the assumption that merely declaring that something is a debt is enough to put the debtor under an inescapable obligation runs through the way that biblical writers understood the duties of the young and the old to each other. It's kind of there also in the Alcestis. That who owns? It's, it's the language of debt. It also raised an unfamiliar question for me. Now, this series runs under the title God and the Good. Philosophical conundrums abound with that kind of question, of course. Is the good good because of it's what God wills? Or is God good because he does or wills what is good measured by external criteria? That's an old philosophical conundrum. For someone who, like me, spends my time studying the Hebrew Bible, a lot depends, though, on who you mean by God. If we're talking of the God who appears as a character in those texts rather than the God of philosophy, things become a bit more tricky. Here's a quotation that probably hasn't often been spoken in these walls before. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction, jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Might not surprise you to re- when I tell you that that comes from the pen of one Richard Dawkins. But if we're going to put that God into the same sentence as the good... Dawkins is certainly going to have problems, and so do many other people. If we all acted the way the God of the Hebrew Bible does, things would come to a pretty pass. But what had occurred to me, and this is very much an idea that I've just had that I want to explore further. You can tell me if it's got any purchase at all, that Graeber may be pointing us to a mechanism that explains why in the end any such characterization of the God of the Hebrew Bible is irrelevant within the ethical framework of the biblical text themselves. It's a moral principle, I think, and I get that as I get most of my ethical principles from watching Judge Judy. I hope you're all fans of Judge Judy. You ever watch Judge Judy? Well, Judge Judy gets it right. She knows what right from wrong. One of the principles she reiterates is that there is, I don't know if you ever watched the program, it's a sort of court program, there's an endless procession of slightly feckless young ladies 
who turn out to have signed over all their money so that the boyfriend who is going to disappear got a motorbike. And he argues, I'm not paying for the motorbike because it was a gift, because she loves me so much, because obviously I'm so lovable. Judge Judy won't go for that. It doesn't matter what you think of your spouse or your partner or the person from who you borrowed money or what they do to you. You still owe them the money. You don't get to say, I don't owe you anything because you're a so-and-so. You still owe it. We can deal with the so-and-so bit somewhere else. But you owe the money. God may be all the things Dawkins says he is. If you're infinitely in his debt, you've still got to pay the debt. You don't have to like God. You can't get away with arguing that you only pay your debts back to good people. People won't let you get away with that one. Put another way, devise a mechanism that means that people conceive themselves to be in debt merely from the fact of existing then you no longer need to treat them as people because they have become commodities. They become their own debt. And they have to pay you back however they, you treat them. The notion of the debt of life, whether anyone owes a life to another, which gives rise to this question of the relative value of lives, blurs all sorts of questions round the intrinsic or earned goodness of the actual people involved. Now, I'm confessing that I've not digested all the consequences of this kind of insight or the weaknesses of the argument. There's a lot more to be said. But I have become more aware of the pervasiveness of metaphors derived from debt and its obligations, both within contemporary discourse about the elderly and in the Hebrew Bible. Now, in what follows, I'm going to revert to the topic I was originally proposing because I want to flesh out what we may be able to deduce about the life of the elderly in the context in which the biblical texts were written and how the biblical writers envisaged that they should be treated all the time bearing in mind the force of this potentially dangerous underlying metaphor of debt. It's really surprising how little has been published on the role of the elderly in Israelite society, ancient Israelite society. It rather parallels the historic lack of studies of women or children in the biblical world until recent times. The causes of the neglect are similar. Leaving aside the prejudices and interests of biblical scholars, which are always a problem, um, the Bible itself marginalizes these groups. Women, children, and the elderly are doubly disadvantaged in this way. They're not the ones who write the texts, although we need to qualify that statement a bit. And on the whole, they're not active public participants in the social life of the ancient world. When they do appear in our texts, they're exceptions and either vanish quickly from the story or are somehow assimilated to the social norm of the male in his prime. That means we're not rich in the records of the lives and experience of the elderly and have to work by inference and analogy in a way that's liable to reflect our own societal preferences unless we're very astute. There's no study of ancient Israel, for instance, or the lines of an excellent book, which I do recommend to you. This one you can read. Tim Parkin's book, Old Age in the Roman World, A Cultural and Social History. It's very illuminating in many ways if you're at all interested in the life of the elderly. It suggests a lot of questions that we'd love to be able to answer in the study of the elderly in ancient Israel. 
But the Roman world left us memoirs, legal documents, and philosophical treatises that deal with the subject of old age. And we have very little that's equivalent for ancient Israel. There's a very interesting edited volume on the care of the elderly in the ancient Near East that looks at, again, legal materials from ancient Mesopotamia and the ancient civilizations. And that reveals things that were going on in cultures round about ancient Israel. But we've lost that kind of material in ancient Israel. We don't have the raw data. But what we do have suggests several things. Life expectancy in Israel, as in the ancient world in general, was very much shorter than it is now. But that never meant that people couldn't live into old age. It just meant lots of people die. Those who survived the main cutoff points, which are infant mortality and the dangers of late adolescence. We forget that. You get through five, the next really dangerous point is late adolescence. For men, military service and other violence begin to weed you out. For women, very significantly, childbirth. But if you got through your first experience of those, you could live well past your 40s. Now, Psalm 90 gives an age of 70 or 80, as all one can reasonably expect, which is not the same as holding it out as a norm. It's just, well, if you get to 70, you can't complain. Moses is this only biblical figure other than the people in the very early parts of Genesis who live extraordinary lives. But Moses is the only figure who makes the age of 120 mentioned in Genesis 6.3, which West Semitic parallel suggests is really seen as the maximum rather than a norm. Moses achieves it, but 120 is the maximum. But this old age, to reach such an age in ancient Israel, is that a blessing or a curse in the view of the biblical writers? Fullness of days is a phrase they use. Is that a good thing or a bad one? To live long enough to see one's grandchildren is often put forward as the ultimate that can be hoped for in the Hebrew Bible, especially given its lack of interest in the afterlife. By contrast, wicked people are often threatened with an early death. That seems to suggest long life is a reward for virtue. But this understanding is in tension with three intractable facts of existence, which the writer of the book of Ecclesiastes is only too aware of. One is that the good and evil alike finally are subject to death, Being good doesn't only delays death, it doesn't stop it. The second, that length of life and your standing with Yahweh aren't really correlated in actual experience. The psalmists, Ecclesiastes say, well, I've seen good people die young, and I've seen right so-and-sos live to a ripe old age. That's what we see. So what's going on here? Good people do die young, and the wicked prosper. Thirdly, prolongation of life may simply mean the prolongation of suffering. We only think of the book of Job. Job is very keen that his life should be ended. You read chapter 3. He doesn't want more of this, thank you very much. Stop now, enough. There's no correlation between those who suffer and those who we might think would deserve to suffer. It's not the same. Nothing to do with each other. Long life may simply mean a longer period to be subjected to the bodily decline and indignities that come with the process of aging. How is that any kind of reward for being good? Wouldn't it be more of a reward to be spared that? In the ancient world, the problems that beset the elderly are, of course, not just those of bodily decline and increasing frailty. Sooner or later, the elderly lose the ability to fend for themselves. 
they become net consumers rather than producers of the food and the wealth of the community. In a sense, they revert to the status of children. Children are the drain on the resources of uh, an agricultural um, community when they are young, but of course the expectation is that they are going to become the next generation of contributors through their labor. You bear the loss because in the end they will be the producers. But what's the future value of the elderly once they've gone past their sell-by date? How long are you going to keep feeding them? Each year, each month, they're liable to be less productive and more needy. What do they have to give? Well, the answer is, of course, experience. The elderly have seen things before. They've heard people's stories through to their conclusion or lack of conclusion. They also remember they have the time to tell and recreate the stories and the law codes that ensure the continuity of the clan's culture. But of course, for that very reason, it's not entirely surprising that the stories and law codes they pass on, for the most part, enjoin respect and care for the elderly. They're the ones that tell the stories Interesting that the stories all say, look after your grandma. Those who have only wisdom to offer are likely to promote the message that wisdom is sufficiently valuable to warrant their continued support. And read in terms of Graeber's theory, the debt that the elderly begin to accrue to the young, if it's thought of in those terms, seems to be paid for in terms of of their wisdom and experience. Put very crudely, I realize I'm being a bit crude here, if you look after me in old age, I will hand on the tradition to your children that they owe a debt to God, which they can partially repay by looking after you in your old age. So it's worthwhile you cooking me my lunch today because that will ensure your children get their story from their grandma, look after your parents. And, you know, it'll work, it'll work. The Hebrew Bible is very clear. We all know father and mother are to be honored. Ten Commandments, of course. And the book of Proverbs, etc., are full of injunctions to look after and honor parents. But the stories of the Hebrew Bible have incidents that suggest that elderly people were vulnerable. Aged kings, aged advisors might well find themselves ignored, ill-treated, passed over, neglected. I think it's interesting that the Hebrew Bible, unlike Homer, contains only one story that even raises the concept of parasite, the killing of parents. If you know your Homeric Cycles and the Greek gods, there's a whole s series of gods killing their fathers, of kings, young kings killing the father who would be in the way of their succession. That's why, actually, Plato didn't like the poets in his Republic. It was because they went around peddling stories that said it's all right to kill your dad if he's getting in the way. Indeed, it's only sense. Why should an increasingly feeble father stand in the way of a young and vigorous son? There is a cautionary tale in the Hebrew Bible. 2 Kings 8, 7 to 15 has the story of Hazael, He's told by Elisha that he would succeed King Ben-Hadad of Aram. What does he go, do? He goes that very day and hurries the process along by smothering the king with a wetted bed cover. If he's going to be king anyway, why, is he, why wait? The legislation enjoining respect of elders points as much to anxiety on behalf of the elderly 
who can no longer physically defend themselves as it does to the filial respect of the younger generation. Now, one of the really odd things about the Hebrew Bible is that it seems to do away with what one must have been one of the more effective ways of preserving respect for the elderly and ensuring their continuing care in the ancient world. And it's one that continues in many cultures to this day, the practice of worship of ancestors and the belief that the ancestors have continuing effects on your life. If you believe that your elderly relatives may have considerable power over your good fortune once they die, the chances are that you will treat them with a bit more respect and care while they're still alive. I mean, Granny might not be able to do much to you now, but just wait till she dies. Then you'll know all about it. Any grudges they bear will come home to roost. Feeble now, they'll return with occult strength. But the peculiar lack of interest in this whole realm in the biblical text of the Hebrew Bible seemed to militate against using that kind of argument against your children. I mean, it's quite effective to say, if you don't behave yourself, I'll be back to haunt you. Can't do that in the Hebrew Bible. No truck with the dead. Actually, I'm even inclined to speculate that at one level we may owe the existence of some of the Hebrew Bible itself to this very fact. If you can't guarantee you're going to be remembered because of your family's obligation to carry on worship, you know, some kind of worship or remembrance of you, perhaps you could be remembered for your wisdom or for your repository of stories about the history of your family and people. In some cases, it may be what you had written that becomes the only way that you can ensure your memory is kept alive. The wisdom of the elderly was one commodity that they could offer in any ancient Near Eastern culture. The premium on what would seem to have been a heightened value on that in ancient Israel because of the lack of ancestor worship might have something to do with the fact that it's Israel's textual traditions that have survived in a way that is not true of the neighboring cultures. There was a real premium on being remembered through writing. But another element of this in the Hebrew Bible is that prohibiting ancestral worship reinforces the idea that ultimately the debt of life is not owed to your parents, it's owed to Yahweh, to the God of Israel. In a polytheistic system, you can enter into different kind of contracts, even debt indebtedness, to different gods, but you can play them off against each other. The gods themselves get bound by obligations of debt to each other. But Yahweh owes nothing to anybody. His human worshippers owe him, not their parents, an infinite debt. He's the paradoxical point where all bucks stop. He's the creditor who owes nothing, the parent who has never had a parent himself. Now, the dynamics within families might be hard enough. What about the elderly in the ancient world who had no families? And what about in our current policy? We can't put all the weight on families. Many people aren't in a position to rely on them. One route that the ancient world knew was to adopt other family members or orphans or slaves as your nominal heirs. So if you had no children of your own, you could adopt a slave and then they were in the same condition of obligation. You could also throw yourself on the mercy of a wealthy patron as a kind of reward for services given. But what if you were poor and landless? 
the childless widow of a peasant, a slave who'd become too old to earn their keep. Well, there's some evidence, it's very slight, that the destitute could seek help from local temples, particularly if they had some priestly family connections. This definitely seems to have been true in ancient Mesopotamia. We don't really see anything very much of that in the Hebrew Bible. Perhaps when you think of ancient Eli, the blind priest, still elderly, still serving in the temple in Shiloh. Or if we go into the New Testament, which I do only with reluctance, um, Luke, of course, places two elderly people, Simeon, and even more to the point, Anna, in the temple. Anna, indeed, was of a great age, at least 84. And, Luke says, never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. She must have been getting food from somewhere. She must have had somewhere to sleep. Was this part of the social structure of the ancient world that the temple could take on in a very minor way, probably, and for only a few, the role of looking after those who had no family of their own. I sometimes wonder of the phrase in Psalm 23 that many of you will know, I will dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long, may not be simply metaphorical, but point to at least the possibility that food and lodging for the elderly could be found in the temple. But what has any of this to do with us, our current obligations, the current dilemmas of social care that someone like David Mowat is charged with dealing with? Well, at least it reminds us these are not new problems. The scale may be new, the problems aren't. It also reminds us that ancient societies were capable of a degree of care and respect for the elderly that's not always shared by our supposedly more advanced and enlightened ways of dealing with people. But that may be good to bear in mind. Does it take us much further? Well, I want to return one last time to David Graeber. At the end of his long, wide-ranging argument, Graeber summarizes his findings on debt as follows. As it turns out, we don't all have to pay our debts. Only some of us do. Nothing would be more important than to wipe the slate clean for everyone, mark a break with our accustomed morality, and start again. What is a debt anyway, he asks. The debt is just the perversion of a promise. It's a promise corrupted by both mathematics and violence. His argument is to conceive of human relationships such as those between parents and children in terms of a debt incurred and an obligation to be repaid is the fundamental error. His view is that the Bible has been at least partly responsible for fostering and preserving that error. The idea of the debt has the paradoxical effect of effacing other moral obligations between people in the name of the overriding obligation to settle one's debts. But Graeber also says we are long overdue for some kind of biblical-style jubilee, one that would affect both international debt and consumer debt. As so often in any moral discussion, the Bible begins to appear on both sides of the, de of the equation. It's both problem and potential solution. Indeed, you could almost argue it's the potential solution precisely because it very often caused the problem in the first place. How that would work out in the case of the care of the elderly in our society is a moot point. But the thing it might suggest is that we need to be very careful 
of the consequences on human relationships when it appears that the young are being put into obligatory debt, both through the taxation system and through devices like the student loan, in order to pay a debt that pensioners perceive is owed to them from a system that obliged them to pay national insurance throughout their lives. We put the young in debt in order to pay the debt that the pensioners feel they are owed because they were made to pay in their day. We can see that the question of who owes a life to whom, whether all are equal of worth, can begin to surface again the question of Alcestis, really. It's quite interesting, some of the things, I don't know if any of you looking at Facebook and so on, some of the things that younger people were saying about older people in the wake of the Brexit vote. Why are they mortgaging our future? They shouldn't be allowed to vote. Shouldn't be allowed to vote when you're over 65, say some young correspondents, because it's not going to worry you. You'll be gone. It's me that's going to have to live with it. All these kind of tensions are exacerbated in a system that depends on debt and speaks of these relationships in these uh, metaphorical terms. It's not simply a metaphor either, it's a reality. Graeber says that's bound to lead to resentment and eventually to people seeking violently to overthrow the unfairness of such a system. Most of the time, though, that just simply means that the, the either things pick up and go back to what they were, or old debtors become new creditors. Looking at the Hebrew Bible to solve such problems won't provide an instant policy solution, won't even tell you very clearly what to do in your own circumstance. But it does remind us, I think, that equating God and the good is a perilous business within any religious system. Who gets to determine what the good is and what their conception of God may be are actually political, not theological decisions. They happen within human societies and institutions. And I think what I want to end up by saying to David Mowat, be careful that the language of debt and obligation doesn't encourage people to embark on the kind of commitment that's needed in cherishing and supporting the humanity of their elderly dependents with a grudging spirit. A grudging response to a sense of obligation will sour rather than cheer the final days of a dependent parent's life, even if in another sense it may prolong that life. We need to be alert to the implications of the metaphors of debt, the idea of the debt of life, that underpin theological discourse, as well as legal and sociological understandings. Maybe we should be thinking about gifts. Maybe we should think about promises. Maybe we should think about invitations rather than obligations. What that entails, we have yet to find out. It may be that if we cannot find another way to order economic and social life, the current generation may not survive long enough to be troubled about the consequences of old age. Now, that would be one solution to the dilemma, but I don't suppose it's anyone's preferred solution. That might be an inadequate ending. Last word goes to the most grandfatherly of all biblical books, the apocryphal book of Sirach or Ecclesiasticus, which the translator writes very touchingly at the beginning. It is his grandfather's book. Ecclesiasticus said, do not disdain one who is old, for some of us are also growing old. Thank you very much. <laughs>